Well, thanks for, thanks for having me. It's good to be back. It's been too long, I think, since I've, I've been to a, a floodplain managers conference. I was able to talk to a lot of old friends, and hopefully we'll get a chance to, to do that uh, during the break. So I'm going to uh, talk about um, uh, a global phenomenon and its relationship to, to local communities. In essence, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about a number of issues that are outlined in the book that uh, was just referenced that I wrote with a colleague of mine from New Zealand, Bruce Glavovic. Uh, we'll talk about its relevance at the local level, but also its connectivity to local floodplain management. Uh, talk about um, issues, lessons, and opportunities. I'll talk a little bit about our hazard mitigation study uh, and conclude with some, some recommendations. So thinking of the, the book, uh, we looked at disaster resilience and sustainability as a broad organizing principle. And in fact, if you look at these two images, the image on the top, and we also, I should say we also looked at planning, the idea of land use planning as a central theme. And if you look at the image on the top, that is the basic hazard mitigation planning process, if you will. Uh, most of you in the room are very familiar with that. If you look at the bottom, uh, if you can't read those words at the bottom, just let me promise you that uh, that is, actually that's from a National Academy's report on climate change adaptation planning. So it shouldn't surprise us that they are almost identical. Uh, slight change in, plan in terms, but they're, they're very similar. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about, and the central focus of the book is, what are those lessons, what are those things we know about natural hazards management, and by that I mean, ha I refer to hazard mitigation and disaster recovery, and what is it we know about climate change adaptation, and how do we get these two communities to work together better to address a common aim like uh, achieving more resilient communities. Again, if you can read that, I guess you might be able to read that in the back, but just, and I'm not gonna read this entire definition, but the reason I mentioned, or I put this up there, it's uh, from David Godchalk, who wrote a, an article on urban hazard mitigation, and he, I think it's one of the best definitions of resilience. It's actually quite comprehensive, but I just wanna point out a few things. I think all of us uh, involved in floodplain management recognize and do most of these things, but one of the things that Dave talked about, the notion of resilience is bigger than hazard mitigation. It not only allows us, if you will, to rebound following a shock to the system, but it also implies that we're learning and changing our behavior uh, over time, which in many ways is adapting to inherently dynamic nature of hazards. And if we think about that in the relationship, not just floodplains and floods, uh, and add this additional dimension of uncertainty associated with climate change, uh, there's a lot of lessons that we can draw and we can still utilize this theme, I would argue, to, to link those two groups. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, just but to give you a very quick introduction to the text, and I, I don't expect you to, um, to, to take away from you an in-depth discussion of any of these chapters, but, and, and I assume that these slides will be available um, to those, so if you're interested. In essence, what we did is we did an international assessment of um, nations and communities around the world, whether it was in India, or whether it was in Samoa, or Australia, the UK, and uh, Peru, and so forth. And we basically looked at um, those nations that experienced a major event. It could have been a flood, it was an earthquake in Peru, for example, and what are the lessons they learned from those major disasters in terms of hazard mitigation, and how could that be applied to, to climate change adaptation? We also looked at a number of other uh, groups, uh, flooding in New Zealand, for example. Uh, we looked at earthquake risk reduction in, um, uh, in, in California, we looked at bushfires in Australia and so forth. And again, these are just, the reason I mention these and put these up very briefly is just to give you a feel for the breadth of the different hazards uh, that we looked at. Some of the, the central themes that emerged from all of those case studies were, uh, were several, uh, many of which that uh, I would argue you almost assuredly do in your, in your work as floodplain managers, the importance of collaborative governance. This is a term that's becoming more popular uh, in the academic world, but it also is becoming more uh, familiar to us in the, in the uh, applied world. Uh, in many ways, FEMA might refer to this as whole communities, although I would argue that governance is really broader than the current definition of FEMA's whole community, which includes quasi-governmental groups, which should include other nations, which should include groups that emerge after disaster. So to me, that's just, this notion of governance is broader uh, than the idea or the concept of whole community at the, at the federal level as currently defined. Uh, the idea of recognizing pre-event conditions, Ron talked about some of those issues too, whether it's politics, whether it's the way you regard your environment, uh, whether it's wealth and class and so forth, uh, those predispose your communities or those are often um, predictors, if you will, of the degree to which you can incorporate risk reduction or 
Uh, there are also issues to think about in terms of, uh, for example, equity. If, in fact, you're trying to address risk reduction, making sure that you address those individuals that perhaps are least able to help themselves. Uh, the idea of establishing good vertical and horizontal connectivity across uh, uh, policies and programs to think about this connectivity between local, state, federal, and in this day and age, international policies and how well those are aligned. And if, in fact, they're contradictory, again, an example that Ron raised, the, the National Flood Insurance Program, Ron, as a local uh, administrator, is going above and beyond what FEMA is doing. So they're actually recognizing that there may be a disconnect or a disincentive, uh, and they're taking action. But again, if you can ideally vertically align uh, policies, you certainly can uh, uh, more effectively address uh, disaster resilience. Viewing disasters as focusing events, the idea, if you will, of taking advantage of disasters as an opportunity, and with an important caveat is that, uh, again, <laughs> referring to something that Ron said, is that this can be an opportunity for developers or others to come in and rebuild a community perhaps even more vulnerable than it was beforehand. So the idea of recognizing disasters as focusing events to affect positive change, in this case, making your community more resilient. Some adaptation challenges and opportunities we, uh, we have referred to in our book, this, this, this challenge between slow onset uh, and or episodic events, uh, and how do we deal with this? Uh, the idea of episodic events like floods versus the, the slow onset issue like drought, uh, or the idea of sea level rise in our coastal communities. If it's slow onset, how are we going to get elected officials and administrators to take action today if, in fact, these uh, effects may not be felt for decades? Uh, it takes a lot of political will to do that. Uh, the different um, camps of researchers and practitioners in the um, natural hazards risk management community, we often think of the social scientists, we have the engineers engaged too, uh, but in the climate change arena, um, in many cases, they're physical scientists. And trying to get these two groups, the, the, these, um, this collection of, uh, of experts together to engage in a meaningful dialogue is, is challenging, but something we need to, need to recognize. The idea that uh, in the U.S. and other nations we're developing policy frameworks, in some ways we're develop developing them in tandem. We have a, a robust natural hazards risk management policy framework or set of frameworks. We're developing another set of climate change adaptation frameworks. In many cases, they're running in parallel. Uh, they're not necessarily intertwined. They're doing more and more of that. I know Sam was here uh, earlier, and I'm sure she spoke to that issue, and it's good to hear that somebody like Sam is actually, Sam Medlock is actually uh, working with the Council of Environmental Quality, thinking about these connectivity, or these connective issues. Uh, the idea of linking global assessments, you know, this is happening more and more, whether it's Munich Re or whether it's the academic community, uh, developing these global assessment models that are becoming increasingly precise, but we still have a fundamental challenge of how do we downscale very complex climatological data to the community scale. It's still a big issue, and it's incumbent on us, I would argue, as floodplain managers and planners to take the best available data and use that. And I know all of you as floodplain managers do that every day, but this is a new challenge, I would argue, is figuring out what is data that you can use and incorporate into your flood risk reduction strategies. Some broad issues uh, defining risk, this was touched on on the panel as well, but this idea of continued development, including uh, rapid development in high hazard areas, an aging population, these all go to the issues of social vulnerability. Uh, the idea that we still have uh, within our policy framework a, a largely reactive set of policies. I'll talk about the Disaster Mitigation Act in, in a minute, but a lot of our policies are still reactive. We're adopting new policies. If you get a chance, I'd encourage you to look at Claire Rubin's disaster timeline. If you Google that, it'll pop up, and you start to track these major disasters and how that led to the advent of a series of new federal pieces of legislation. It's an interesting way to look at it, but it's reactionary, and we ought to be proactive instead of reactionary. The idea of settlement patterns and land use, you know, we're continuing to sprawl into floodplains, into known high hazard areas. This is happening with increasing regularity. And we even have groups uh, now that are addressing and trying to make that linkage between, for example, smart growth and, if you will, safe growth. The EPA is doing that, and I applaud them for that. But we still have, for example, what some uh, in the planning community um, view as, a, as a, a pretty thoughtful organization, the new urbanists. Um, and there's been evidence to suggest that new urbanism, while encouraging compact urban form, uh, and there's been empirical evidence to show this, it's encouraging compact urban form in flood prone areas. And so it's really not necessarily um, improving necess our uh, flood risk reduction, rather it's exacerbating it. When in reality, if in fact we were working better with them, we could encourage them to do compact urban form that is more sustainable, does not emit as much carbon gases, 
outside the floodplain, for example. These are all challenges that, uh, that we face. So the Disaster Mitigation Act, all of you in the room understand the Disaster Mitigation Act, but I just wanted to mention that uh, in many ways the, the genesis of the act really, if you really go back to the beginning, and when the, the genesis of the act was trying to, ex to spend unexpended post-disaster hazard mitigation funding. That was the political point and the driving force behind it. It was also trying to do something proactive to, to require the development of pre-disaster hazard mitigation plans. But given that that was the primary impetus to get the federal hazard mitigation grant program dollars that have been sitting in some communities for decades spent, uh, it's not surprising that in many ways, and I'll talk about this in more detail in just a moment, is that many of the plans that have been developed as a result of this act are really focused on identification of projects. They're not necessarily forward-looking documents. They should be, but many of the documents that we reviewed were retrospective. What can we do to buy out properties at risk as opposed to what can we do to limit development in future flood hazard areas? The, the, the national uh, assessment that we, uh, actually we finished this, it's a six-year study. Uh, we assess the quality of state and local hazard mitigation plans. Uh, we focused on coastal states and communities, so East Coast, Gulf Coast, West Coast, and Great Lakes. Uh, we drew a sample uh, of states and local governments uh, within those states and assessed those plans. And we did that using what we call plan quality principles. I'm not going to read through them, but those in blue are in essence the principles. Those in black are examples of those elements. Um, those of us that have done planning for some time, uh, those are pretty recognized uh, elements in planning. And so what we did is we assessed uh, the degree to which they existed or not, scored them and assessed these plans relative to one another. Some of the key findings. Uh, we had three principal findings. All of them um, were troubling, uh, not surprising. For those of you that have done mitigation plans around the country, this may not surprise you, but now we've got empirical evidence to show it. So there were three problems. One is there wasn't a clear, there wasn't a clear linkage between the findings of the risk assessment, which was often the strongest part of the plan, and the risk reduction policies and projects identified in those plans. So there was a disconnect. You might have had a fairly robust risk assessment, but it didn't necessarily lead to, there wasn't a logical nexus between the uh, list of policies and projects in those plans. The second uh, weakness, primary weakness, was very few of the plans systematically looked at land use as a risk reduction strategy. Rather, those plans were simply a method to identify projects that they might implement should funding become available. Instead of saying we should be looking into the past at, at structures at risk, but we should also be looking into the future and using land use practices to limit future development in those areas. The plans were very weak on the latter component, which is problematic. We also found that almost none of the plans, and we evaluated over 350 local plans, almost none of them looked at climate change adaptation. Now this study and the data that we used were plans that were developed uh, in the early two, or mid 2000s. So things are changing and more and more plans are starting to think about this. So those of you in the community that are involved in mitigation planning, your plan may be better than what we found at the national level because we use plans uh, developed prior to this push uh, to make this connectivity. The other thing we did is we evaluated state plans and uh, we found some, some challenges there too and there's great variation in terms of state capacity, because we looked at the state as a, and the state plan as a means to help build capacity at the local level. So we found three challenges, if you will. State staffing varies dramatically. You might have one staff person. Some states that had a multitude of disasters were able to hire large staffs. Uh, in North Carolina, after Hurricane uh, uh, Floyd, we had a staff of 50 people doing nothing but hazard mitigation. Uh, if you go back today in North Carolina, I think there's six. So my point is there's massive fluctuations in the staffing levels. While we had large sums of money to administer, we, we, we lost a lot of that capacity. It's not sustained over time. Uh, similarly, state policies varied widely. Some states were thinking proactively about, for example, growth management or land use planning, and they were trying to link that to risk reduction. But in many cases, even in those states that might have had a growth management act or a growth management um, requirement in their plans, they were often disconnected from the mitigation plan at the state level. And finally, the notion of capacity building through education and outreach, uh, that varied dramatically in part because of staffing and in part because of the willingness of the state to, uh, to engage uh, in, this, in this effort. One of the other things we looked at is, you know, why is that? What, is, what are some of the characteristics of those uh, communities that might have done better, perhaps, than others? And one of the issues we found, and this, this was um, supplemented by old, older literature, is what we would call the, the emergency manager uh, land use planner divide. 
this has been an ongoing issue in the 90s. This was studied. In fact, I, I was involved in a study in the 90s uh, as a graduate student, early 90s, looking at this, and we found a significant disconnect between the degree to which emergency managers and land use planners worked on risk on hazard mitigation activities. Well, it's still prevalent today. One of the things we also found in our national study is empirical evidence to show that when planners were in the lead or significantly involved in those plans, maybe it shouldn't surprise us, but it, it, it's shown empirically, is that those plans did a better job of incorporating land use measures into those plans. So they were not only retrospective, but they were also looking into the future. Uh, you know, the idea of the complementary skill set, the emergency manager having an often in-depth knowledge of local conditions uh, and also connected to state and federal partners, that vertical connectivity I mentioned, uh, understanding the federal grant programs, or at least engaged in them because the money often flows from FEMA to the state emergency management agency into the, into the local community. And so they have an understanding of those grant programs. Again, there's opportunity for collaboration, but it still is not where it needs to be. Uh, what I would suggest is, uh, you know, and I've just put this as a question really, the idea of the local floodplain administrator, whether you experience that as well, or the degree, or even ask the question, the degree to which you're personally involved in the development of your local hazard mitigation plan. Just to, maybe something we could talk about a little bit later. Some of the other issues and things to think about in terms of, of land use planning and its, its connectivity to adaptation and natural hazards risk management or hazard mitigation is the, the whole idea of the tools that planners bring to the table. And I'm not going to read through all of these, but the idea of land use planning tools and principles are widely utilized for a whole host of activities uh, by planners. Uh, the degree to which those plans and tools are used to reduce risk uh, is much less, and they're, they're significantly underutilized. Uh, and that's a significant problem that we ought to be thinking about. Something that's happening in the, in the planning profession and in the academic uh, profession, if you will, of, of planning, is to think about scenario-based planning. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but something to think about is to address this issue of uncertainty and rising uncertainty in an era of climate change. And so one of the ways to get at that is to develop a suite of potential strategies. Uh, what we would call, in, in a simple form, a series of robust and contingent strategies. Some would call the, robu the robust strategies kind of the no-regret strategies, uh, the idea of a setback off the ocean front or a one-foot freeboard, you know, dealing with some degree of uncertainty. The contingent strategies are those that might change over time based on new findings associated with sea level rise. Is it going to be 5 meters or is it going to be you know, 10 meters, 15 meters, 20 meters? Uh, those types of issues. So it helps us deal with the uncertainty uh, of climate change. So just a, you know, uh, the, the case studies I alluded to in the book um, led to 264 recommendations that are, that are written up in the text itself, but we distilled them into four imperatives, if you will. And I'm going to talk about a few of the examples of these in, in my closing comments. Um, so one is a governance imperative. I've talked about the value and importance of governance and to think about it very broadly, uh, but also a capability or capacity imperative, the idea of building capacity at the local level to address a changing climate. This includes, for example, the use of indigenous knowledge that we sometimes underutilize uh, or incorporate into uh, state and national policy. A planning imperative, the idea of developing meaningful, thoughtful, robust, pre disaster hazard mitigation plans and pre-event climate change adaptation plans, and even a moral imperative. It's incumbent on us as professionals, whether we're planners or floodplain managers, uh, to recognize that in many ways this has a, a moral, it has moral implications. If we don't act today, uh, our future generations are going to be inheriting uh, the problems that we left behind. And so there really is to me, or to, to myself and, and the colleagues that wrote the book, a real moral imperative. So I just have a couple more slides and just want to close with a few of these. I, you may not be able to see the, the cartoon. It is dated. Uh, that was during the presidential election when uh, President Obama and Romney were running and they were talking about uh, you know, something that they had forgotten and it was in the midst of Super Storm Sandy. And even when that happened, there was still a, a, a relative lull in conversation about that. Now, it's good to see that the president's talking about this uh, more explicitly. And one of the ways to, to get at that is to think about developing plans that uh, are retrospective and prospective, uh, whether it's hazard mitigation plans, floodplain management plans, climate change adaptation plans. In order to do that, I would suggest, for example, in uh, hazard mitigation plans, we ought to require local governments to include a land use element. That's not required. Communities aren't required to do that, and as a result, they, most of them don't do it. 
Uh, I would suggest that we need to include that, and if in fact it's not included, that we ought to consider uh, disinvesting or not allowing them to gain access to pre- and post-disaster funding. Uh, the idea of addressing the planner emergency manager divide, um, that is an issue that's ongoing, and you could say addressing the emergency manager planning a floodplain administrator divide in the sense that, you know, these are, these are groups that, that have complementary skills, uh, but I would argue that we're not effectively working together, and we really ought to, we need to change that. Uh, the idea of requiring a clear linkage between the risk assessment as in, in policies and projects. So, <clears throat> as I alluded to earlier, the mitigation plans, one, is they tend to be project focused. They tend to look into the past, and a lot of the plans are not, um, they're not effectively looking at policies in addition to the identification of projects. And they ought to be doing both policies and projects. Uh, and without do, if you're not doing both, you're not doing a systematic uh, approach uh, to risk reduction. And then explicitly linking climate change adaptation, comprehensive land use plans, and climate change uh, adaptation plans. One way to do that is through scenario planning. And just the last slide is to, is to think about the uh, increased federal, state, and local capacity building. And so I would even make the argument that, you know, we often talk about capacity building and we assume it's local. <clears throat> I would argue we need to think about capacity building for states and we need to build capacity for the federal government. The federal government is often overwhelmed in major disasters, uh, but we often don't talk about that uh, until it happens and then the media is everywhere and then they blame FEMA for everything. Instead of saying, wait a minute, let's step back and let's think about this in the broader governance perspective, I mean, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around. And I'm not saying that we ought to just blame everybody. I'm just saying that the federal, state, and local governments all have a role to play. The challenge is how do we build the capacity of all of these entities, not just the local capacity, but also the state and the federal capacity. And then thinking about addressing this larger governance challenge, and how do we, how do we deal with this um, uh, over time? <clears throat> One of the things that we need to do is address these powerful disincentives uh, to be resilient. We all talk about becoming resilient. We all show the case study of the buyouts and, and the other things that are good and that we've done. Uh, but in reality, there are very powerful disincentives to do those types of things. Uh, the National Flood Insurance Program is one. In fact, it, Ron and I hadn't even met, we hadn't talked in years, and it turns out that his comments were just right in line with, with mine. So the National Flood Insurance Program is one. <clears throat> but another one we often don't talk about is the massive post-disaster investment after disasters, when the majority of those funds are used to rebuild communities to their pre-event condition. These are massive disinvestments to get people to do the right thing. I know it's not easy because we've got major issues of political will uh, before us, but these are major hurdles uh, for us to, to deal with and think about. And then finally, perhaps in closing, <clears throat> and maybe it's because I've come back and gone back to the universities to think about this notion of sustainability and resilience and its connectivity, the idea of thinking about future generations. And one way to deal with future generations is to educate them, whether it's our children, whether it's our students, whether it's our colleagues, is to think about <clears throat> how do we better educate the next generation uh, to deal with uh, risk reduction, climate change adaptation. Thank you.